Just remember the stuff presented by this creepy bear is from the Evolution 101 website, written by the Understanding Evolution Team. Commentary by rent friend 2000 That's me! Adaptation. An adaptation is a feature that is common in a population because it provides some improved function. Adaptations are well fitted to their function and are produced by natural selection. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You just said, you just said produced. Read that line again. Uh, no, no, that's what it says. It says produced? Yeah, produced by natural selection. You're kidding me. No, look. Huh. Okay. Um, adaptations are well fitted to their function and are produced by natural selection. <laughs> it's like beating a dead horse, but here I go again. Natural selection cannot produce anything. All it can do is select or choose from what's already there. Otherwise, we'd call it natural production. This team of PhD should know better than to claim that anything gets produced by natural selection, because it simply isn't true. But don't take my word for it. Here's a team of PhDs which say exactly what I'm saying. However, natural selection and genetic drift cannot operate unless there is genetic variation. Natural selection cannot try to supply what an organism needs. Natural selection just selects among whatever variation exists in the population. What? The Understanding Evolution Team from Part 9 and Part 14B, respectively. What the what? In order to discredit the Evolution 101 website, all I have to do is go to the Evolution 101 website? <laughs> I don't want to go tossing around words like incompetence or deception or liar, liar, pants on fire, but I can't think of another way to put it. Of course they know better. It doesn't take a team of PhDs to know that you can't add by subtracting, but apparently it takes a PhD to believe that you can. Look at their example of natural selection in the previous section. Birds eat the green beetles and leave alone the brown ones until there are no more green beetles. What's left? Brown ones. Hey, you gotta try one, they're delish. Did the birds eating the green ones produce the brown ones? No, it only removed the green ones. To say adaptations are produced by natural selection is again either ignorant or deceptive. To say that species originate by means of natural selection is 180 degrees wrong. Once again, Uncle Chuck needs a new title for his book and a new premise for his book and, and a completely different conclusion. On the other hand, maybe I'll get a bag of M&Ms and eat all the green ones, and then claim I produced the red ones by selecting out the green ones. Would I get paid royalties for that? Either way, I get to eat some chocolate, so I'm going to try it. Anywho, since their entire premise is bunk, I'll therefore skip the list of examples they provide of alleged adaptations. So what's not an adaptation? The answer, a lot of things. One example is vestigial structures. A vestigial structure is a feature that was an adaptation for the organism's ancestor, but that evolved to be non-functional because the organism's environment changed. Evolved to be non-functional. <laughs> How's that for newspeak? Now something formerly useful, becoming useless, is evolution. Oh, these guys could do spin for the White House and report how great the economy has become since so many persons formerly burdened with employment have been promoted to a home-based, unscheduled, non-profit position. <laughs> uh, I miss Trump. How do we know something is vestigial? First, we assume evolution is true. Then we assume the organ or structure in question has no purpose now. Then we assume it had a purpose in the evolutionary past and has, quote, evolved to be non-functional. Then some idiot creationist comes along and suggests the structure has a function, like the appendix or the spleen or the tonsils, and ah, dang it, he's right. So we take those off of the list of vestigial items and keep on believing in evolution. Let me add a quote which kind of tweaks me off. My whole life I was told tonsils and the appendix are vestigial and prove we evolved from monkeys, which... I suppose, had a functioning appendix or something? They never actually fill in that gap for us. These examples are still brought up as proof for evolution in debates, yet look at the date on this quote. For the last 2,000 years, doctors have puzzled over the function of the thymus gland. Modern physicians came to regard it, like the appendix, as a useless vestigial organ, which had lost its original purpose, if indeed it had ever had one. In the last few years, however, men have proved that far from being useless, the thymus is really the master gland that regulates the intricate immunity system which protects us against infectious diseases. Recent experiments have led researchers to believe that the appendix, tonsils, and adenoids may also figure in the antibody responses. Yep, that's from the useless gland that guards our health in Reader's Digest, November of 1966. 1966! That's more than a decade before I was born! But wait, look at the date on this one. There is no longer any justification for regarding the veriform appendix as a vestigial structure. That's from William Strauss's Quarterly Review of Biology from 1947. 1947! This is only two years after World War II, right? It's not just me here, is it? Did you hear this in high school? Because my textbook left this out and taught the exact opposite. Heck, check out the apparent lack of enlightenment from a 2010 National Geographic article. The appendix, a narrow tube that hangs off one end of the colon, is probably the most famous junk organ. But it's turned out to be important even today, in certain circumstances. 
Yeah, that's from Vestigial Organs Not So Useless After All Studies Find, October 2010. Not so useless after all. How about that? It only took National Geographic 63 years to catch up with the quarterly review of biology. High school textbooks may follow any decade now. <laughs> Fish species that live in completely dark caves have vestigial, non-functional eyes. When their sighted ancestors ended up living in caves, there was no longer any natural selection that maintained the function of the fish's eyes. So fish with better sight no longer outcompeted fish with worse sight. Today, these fish still have eyes, but they are not functional and are not an adaptation. They are just the byproducts of the fish's evolutionary history. Huh. This is a great example of something which could actually be argued to be vestigial. If you remove the claim that this has anything to do with evolution, then I agree with this paragraph. It's an example of a non-functional organ which was previously functional and is a kind of change we witnessed within a few generations, thus making it observational-based science. <laughs> like I said before, they give just enough examples of real things to make it seem like there's actual science going on. But there's no bait and switch without the bait. The problem is, this is still a loss! These fish have lost the use of their eyes. In fact, they still retain the information it took to make the eyes, but those genes are switched off. There are lots of examples of living things with genes that do not get used. When the conditions are right, the genes can get switched back on. This is why pasty, colorless Europeans get tan when exposed to sunlight. The gene that produces melanin gets kicked on when they are exposed to lots of sun. This is not evidence of evolution, as evolution requires a gain of genetic information. Turning genes off is not evolution any more than parking your car makes you Henry Ford. Once again, the way cave-dwelling creatures tend to adapt to total darkness by switching off the genes is fascinating, but not an inch closer to supporting evolution as fact. It is actually an example of the exact opposite of what this website is supposed to prove. Discovering that they no longer have functional eyes tells us nothing about where the functional eyes had come from in the first place. And that is the claim they're making about evolution. If we all work together to spread the word, I think we can educate even the Understanding Evolution team and National Geographic. And maybe, just maybe, they might change their tune. All they need is the truth. And 50 or 60 years. Join me next time for more. Woohoo!